that's that is that okay so welcome again and uh, let's pray and then we'll get started okay let's uh, let's just look to the lord in prayer father we we thank you for this day we thank you for this um, for this new term lord even as we spend this time together lord we pray that you would uh, continue to speak to us father god we we surrender ourselves lord into your mighty hands and uh, we just ask for your leading for your guiding lord come and teach us and also remind us of the things that you've taught us lord as you've promised we come at this time we come at this term into your mighty hands in jesus precious name we pray amen amen okay so um good morning good morning rupa okay so um this uh, semester we're going to be looking at um, a subject called biblical preaching uh, in other words uh, technically it's called as homiletics so we're going to be looking at what it involves and um, some of the uh, you know technicalities of it uh, it's a it's a practical course as well okay um, so if you have your course notes you can open up to the uh, Uh, or maybe i'll just present it uh, here so we can all follow um so we're going to be just a minute please um okay yeah um okay so you can see that um so we're going to be looking at um, if you look at the contents um we we'll start by doing a quick review on uh, the hermeneutics which uh, you would have uh, studied in detail last semester um biblical hermeneutics which is interpretation of scripture and then we'll uh, start with homiletics uh, we'll go into um the relevance of preaching why is preaching relevant uh, we'll Uh, also from there we'll move on to the preacher the call of the preacher the qualifications um you know uh, we're using uh, the gender his you know uh, but it refers to both his and her um the ministry of the word okay so what the preacher the content of the message um, the ministry of the word word of god and we're going to look at how the lord jesus ministered the word because he is our example in ministry so um how how did he minister the word and we will also uh, look at uh, the new testament minister you know ministering god's word by the power of the holy spirit we're going to look at that and then we'll move on to some practical um things like preparing a message and also delivering uh, different ways by which we can different ways of presenting um the message that we prepare and also when we minister uh, to minister with the objective of uh, objective of results in the sense uh, we minister in faith expecting fruit so we're going to look at that and then uh, some more practical uh, instructions on presentation and uh, and so on and then also we look at uh, teaching format and then with that we'll we come to the end of this course so um so it's it's uh, it's interesting it's uh, definitely uh, practical and um um oh sorry i uh, just i'm just seeing the um, message here my voice okay i've increased the volume here um maybe you can you can try turning it up in your uh, prabhaka yeah it's okay um just let me know okay okay so uh, i i just want to ask you all you know what comes to your mind when you hear the word uh, preach or preaching or preacher you know you can put it in the chat what comes to your mind when you hear the word preach preaching um preacher what comes to your mind to teach okay forest says it's to teach um any other response what comes to your mind yeah 
you know when I, when i think about it i can't help but um, you know imagine a lot of energy a lot of a lot of drama you know uh, for some reason that comes to my mind right a lot of theater a lot of drama um, okay uh, teaching the word of god okay uh, sermon on the mount uh, right uh, enforcing the message okay sharing the light of his word okay heralding god's word sharing his knowledge okay mm. so what is good and what is not good sam says uh, one way communication lecturing on and on is not good okay susan one who practices and then teaches others okay sharing the truth um salome who has studied the word of god like communicating what you've studied okay awesome good so each of us have uh, you know had some kind of experience uh, either you know uh, i'm sure regularly being believers you know being recipients of uh, of preaching you know maybe good preaching bad preaching but we've been recipients of that and so all of us have this experience all of us have these uh, you know various uh, experiences of uh, uh, maybe uh, some of you have been preaching as well and you've uh, shared and uh, you you are experienced in preaching um you know you have that experience as well okay okay so i just want to uh, share a few things um, before we actually go into her, uh, you know hermeneutics a refresh refresher of hermeneutics um share a few things um that is um uh when we look at the scripture i just want to share a couple of scripture uh one one 1 peter 2 and verse 9 let me just put it here okay uh first peter 2 verse 9 says but you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light so peter is referring to the church the body of believers and he's you know uh just declaring this stating this you are this you are you know uh, several things he mentions here you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation special people and then he goes on to say you know this is your identity uh, and this is your uh, this is your objective or this is what you're called to do that you you have this identity you have this place a position in Christ that you may proclaim okay that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light okay so sometimes when it comes to um the reason i shared this uh, verse and and one more scripture you know um which we're going to look at the reason is this that many sometimes we uh when we look at preaching when we consider preaching we might um you know disqualify us and say okay that is for others i'm called to do something else right so maybe if you can look at the word com- word communicate okay that might be helpful right so because we associate preaching with pulpit ministry which is which is it a bigger part it's a big part of that um, what is being shared and what is being preached from the you know what is called the pulpit ministry or church ministry or um or meetings and so on it's a big part of that um so many times when we hear this or even when we as we study this you know biblical preaching sometimes we uh disqualify us and say you know that is not for me okay maybe that is for somebody who's uh, um you know who who can speak well who's uh, very very um uh what's the word articulate and so on so um so do not disqualify yourself okay because if you look at the scripture that we are chosen you are chosen you are a royal priesthood you are we are a holy nation and we are special in his eyes and we've been called out of darkness into his light and we've been you know we've been given all this that we may proclaim okay so it will it'll be helpful to look at that word proclaim and um, it's uh, when we look at that word uh the word from which we uh, you know um we get preaching and and uh, uh, heralding and so on so uh, this is what it means to tell out or to speak forth to declare abroad to publish to make known by praising or proclaiming or celebrating okay so to speak forth to declare to uh, publish to 
when you praise, you celebrate, and and you do all this. So we have been called. So each one of us in our spheres of influence, uh, we've been called for this. We've been called to this. Okay, and of course, uh, when we look at the Great Commission and what the Lord uh, tells His disciples, you know, if we consider ourselves as followers of Christ or his disciples, um, we see, you know, this is something which is given for any Christ follower. I mean, you know, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, this word here, uh, preach, is uh, the, the meaning is herald or to, um, to proclaim, you know, like how uh, a herald would do it to, uh, like a messenger who would announce Right to officiate as um, uh, do the work of a herald to, to announce, and um, uh, so it comes with this whole function of uh, you know you're going there on behalf of someone, and you're carrying a message that is of uh, paramount importance, and you are on behalf of someone you are actually proclaiming that message you're heralding that message right so to preach is to herald so so this is what the lord has called each one of us to do to go and herald uh, the message to go and proclaim i think to sam who mentioned herald right heralding now so you go as a messenger and you herald that message right so so now when we when we look at it we see that okay uh, i have a role to play right i've been called to preach i've been called to announce i've been called to uh, be a messenger right each one of us if, if we are christ followers we, we are commissioned to do this by the lord right so the way in which we do it the audience or the sphere of influence um might be different okay so don't worry about that right so uh, right now it's important for us to just acknowledge the fact and accept the truth that, yes, I've been called out of darkness into light. Yes, I am chosen. Yes, I am special in his eyes. Yes, I am a royal priesthood, a priest, you know, a, a royal priest, which means I'm royalty as well as I am called to this priesthood, um, that I represent God um, uh, to the people and I represent people to God, right? And, uh, and, and this is what this is my calling as a believer, as who someone who's washed by his blood, who, who's a new creation. Right. So um, with that, um, just want to look at what Paul tells Timothy, and uh, you know, this is this whole thing of interpreting scripture. Paul gives Timothy uh, both in First uh, Timothy and Second Timothy. Paul uh, writes to him, and uh, if you if you read through this uh, both these epistles, you see that he he tells uh, in First Timothy he writes to Timothy and, and he says, you know, um, uh, you charge. Uh, let me just read that. You charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Okay, so he's saying uh, Timothy. In other words, he's saying Timothy, you be careful. Um, you know what kind of teaching. What is being taught? What is being proclaimed? Um, I, I, this is in First Timothy chapter one, um, yeah, verse three. Okay, uh, verse three. And I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, no other teaching, um, nor give heed to fables. Okay, nor listen to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Now, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart and so on. So he's saying, you know, uh, in other words, he's saying you, you go there and you command, you know, the people that they teach no other doctrine. Uh, they do not teach something. They do not preach something which is not resulting in godly edification, which is not edifying, but it's causing disputes. Right? It's uh, endless genealogies or fables or something that uh, that is just imaginary but is not of the truth, and it just which is causing disputes. So he he wants Timothy. And if you if you look at um, um, yeah, if you look at uh, you know chapter four and verse six again, instruct the brethren in these things, um, nourished in the words of faith and the good doctrine which you have carefully 
followed. So, and Second Timothy again, he says, um, uh, let me just read from Second Timothy chapter um, uh, chapter two, and um, chapter two. Um, yeah, chapter 2, verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, rightly dividing the word of truth, which means that you, you know, you interpret it well. So the reason is this, you know, when our, um, uh, you know, teaching results in revelation and with revelation comes conviction and with conviction, we are moved to action and this results in uh, our destiny right when we when we make it part of our life it uh, really changes the let me just put it here it just changes the uh, our destiny or influences or affects our destiny so it starts with teaching right it starts with uh, what we are influenced by what we receive um, so teaching and the uh, Holy Spirit illuminates, he quickens, he gives us revelation, and uh, which, which causes deep conviction, right? Uh, there's change, there's a reason for change, there's confidence for change, and that results in transformation, um, the Holy Spirit in our lives, and which moves us to action. Like, so we begin to do things that we earlier did not consider, or um, earlier which we thought that we could not do you know, there's, there's suddenly it results in faith and we want to go out and step out and do things. And that comes as a result of this, right? So now, what if the teaching is, um, you know, it's not the truth, okay? It results in deception. If I'm, you know, I could be sincere, but if I receive something that is not the truth, of course, the Holy Spirit will warn me, will give me a check, but... If I'm um, a young believer, a new believer, and if I just receive that, or if I look to the person, you know, who's uh, who's teaching and preaching, and I'm I'm not really checking, right? I'm not listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Um, I don't check, uh, you know, just like the Berians did, which we read in the Book of Acts. Just if I if I don't check, right, and uh, then it results in wrong believing. Right, so uh, which means that uh, with the wrong believing, I'm moved to wrong action, and that again influences and changes my destiny. So, um, so Paul is very clear to Timothy. He says, you know, this is what you do. This is what you need to do. So, therefore, for us also, as people who have been called to preach or share or communicate the truth, okay, as people who have been called to be communicators of the truth. Um, in various spheres, in various scenarios, uh, we need to be careful um, about the interpretation. Okay, so therefore, we're just going to look very quickly, um, uh, go through some some of the things that you have already studied uh, in hermeneutics, and we're going to look at that. Okay, um, okay. So let's go through um, a few things in hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. So when it comes to interpreting scripture, okay, this is something that you'd have seen. Uh, you can follow in the notes. I'm on page uh, page four. When it comes to interpreting scripture, uh, we need to interpret it grammatically, historically, and critically. Okay? These are some basic uh, uh, rules, foundations, uh, which, which we need to follow in order to interpret scripture. So grammatically, which means that, uh, okay, the words that we see have meaning. So we don't assign our own meaning to these words. Okay, we, um, we interpret it and we take the meaning of the words that are given and we, we interpret it, right? So in other words, you know, what, is the, what does it say grammatically? What, does it, uh, what, do, what do these words mean? What do these phrases mean? What do these sentences mean? And, uh, and then we, we interpret it. Okay, so which means that you, we simply take the language. Um, maybe we're looking at the original language, or we could be looking at the translations into whatever language that you know uh, 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 that you read in. It could be English or Hindi or 
Spanish, whatever, you know, you, you look at that language and, uh, you know, how is it translated and, uh, you know, what does it mean? And uh, we receive the meaning. Okay, we interpret it that way. Uh, uh, some, uh, and I like this quote, if the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense. Okay, so you read it and it's as plain, it's very clear. So don't assign any deeper meaning to it or don't seek out any other Thing. If it makes sense, don't don't seek any other thing, right? So um, you know, scriptures like John three verse thirty six. Okay, let me just read: He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. So um, there's no two ways around it. Scripture is very clear; it's very plain, and it's there for all 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 of us to read and understand, right? So um, so you don't, there's no need to seek a deeper meaning in it. You know, it's very clear. It's very plain. So you look at the words, we look at grammar, look at the language, and we uh, interpret it. Okay. Second thing is that as we do this, okay, I'm, I'm going to look at the language. I'm going to look at the words, and uh, I, I receive the meaning of it. Um, second thing is that the, in language, we also have figures of speech. Okay. We also have, uh, you know, uh, literary, um, what do you call literary tools or figures of speech like metaphors and similes, right? Uh, for example, if you look at um, Mark chapter 1 and verse 5, um, it's there in the notes. Let me just read it out. It says, then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. So it's talking about uh, John the Baptist, right? The ministry of John the Baptist. It says, all the land of Judea now, uh, did everyone go? Okay, may not be, but most did, right? So it, it, it could be a hyper, hyperbole. It is a hyperbole. It's um, a figure of speech. Then oh, everyone went. All of us went. Okay. Um, then, then all were baptized. Okay. So which means that um, uh, it is a hyperbole. It means that most people went. Uh, and it was the majority that God baptized uh, under the ministry of uh, John the Baptist. Okay. Another, another verse to look at, uh, Luke chapter 22 and verse 19, the Lord Jesus, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Here again, you know, uh, the Lord is, uh, it's a symbol. The Lord is giving the bread and, and he's saying, this is, my body, which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. So um, it is it is a symbolic act, but it has a deeper meaning, of course. It's referring to his sacrificial death on the cross. But here, when he when he breaks the bread and he and he gives it to his disciples, saying, This is my body. Uh, when he says that, we know that it's it, he doesn't mean it literally, right? Um, or you know, it's like how we say, you know, he was a lion in battle. She was a lion in battle. Okay, now that's uh, that means that she fought like a lion. She was as fierce as a lion in battle. So it's a figure of speech again. So we need to be aware of this when we when we study scripture. Okay, moving on. If a passage has symbols, okay, now we know uh, you know a lot of scripture, um, uh, like especially the, the prophetic books and when we look at the book of revelation a lot of symbols are there okay. so um when 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 symbols are there we see that uh, in scripture um scripture itself gives the meaning of those symbols okay let's uh, a classic example is uh, when we look at revelation uh, chapter 1 um sorry. Uh, it's there in the notes i'm just typing it here revelation chapter 1 and um, uh, verses 9 to 20. Okay. So Revelation chapter 1, let's just turn there. Uh, verses 9 to 20. So uh, John is there in the island of Patmos and he has this encounter and he writes about that. Um, so he says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Pat Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So um, 
um, so, uh, so that's how he start and starts. And then he goes on to say, he, he describes uh, in verse 12, and I s turned, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, verse 13, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with garment. He goes on to uh, describe um, who was there in the midst of the uh, seven golden lampstands, right? and what he did, and what he wore, and what he had. And uh, verse 17, he says, I fell down uh, as uh, at his feet as dead. And in verse 20, the Lord Jesus, who he speaks, and he gives the he gives the meaning of those symbols of that uh, in that encounter, what John saw, the Lord Jesus gives the meaning of those symbols. He says, you know, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven gold golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you lampstands which you saw are are the seven churches. Okay, so you see that um, there is uh, there there are those symbols. And we see that there is the meaning of the of the symbols, which is also uh, the clarified, which is given there. So, um, so we see that uh, that is also you know mentioned in in scripture. So, um, so in in such cases we um, sorry um, in such cases we you know we look at the uh, symbols and we see that it has already been described and we we get the meaning of it. We in get the interpretation. Uh, of uh, of that particular text. Okay, then moving on. Okay, uh, first one we said was grammatically we interpreted. The second one is to interpret it historically. Okay, so s there could be some practices. There could be some uh, you know something some traditions which are mentioned there, for which we need to look at the history of it. We we'll need to look at the background of it. Okay, and a classic uh, example is cutting a covenant. Okay, so, so here uh, in our day and time, when it comes to making an agreement or a contract, um, which is, uh, you know, a covenant is much deeper than that, of course. But then here, you know, we don't necessarily uh, keep, uh, you know, uh, animals, sacrifice animals, split them apart and walk through. Right? But that is what cutting a covenant meant in the biblical times, in those times. Right? And we see that example in Genesis, where uh, God does that, or does that, uh, you know, with Abraham. Right, Genesis 15. We see that. Then um, another uh, thing that we see is in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 11 and uh, verses 4 to 6, where where Paul writes about uh, uh, about women and how short hair or uh, shaving their hair is shameful for a woman. Okay. And the thing is, uh, when we look at it, uh, does that mean women could should not, uh, you know, uh, cut their hair, or does that mean that they should always cover their hair, cover their head? Okay. Um, so when we look at the um, the background, historical background of Corinth and how there were many uh, temple prostitutes, both male and female, uh, in the temple of Aphrodite, which was a deity that uh, they worshipped, and uh, how it was a very hedonistic society. And from that society in in Corinth, when when Paul went and he did the work, a strong church was established and people were getting saved and they were coming to church. So he's explaining you know, the, so we need to understand that this was the background there. So the historical background. So that helps as well. You know, when we understand, when we read scripture, and not really make a doctrine of it and say, "Hey, you cut your hair," or "Hey, you didn't, um, you know, cover your head." Now, you know, you are condemned, or you know, or not to st start to make a doctrine out of it, but really understand the culture, understand the, you know, what was really happening there, and. Uh, for us to do that, of course, we can use biblical um, or Bible dictionaries or commentaries to to really understand that. Okay. Uh, the third thing uh, is to interpret it critically, which means that does it make sense? Okay. Does it make rational sense? Okay. When you read a, a passage of scripture, so there are some uh, there are six rules that we can look at um, when we interpret something critically. Okay. So critically, it just means that it has to make that argument 
all the premise which is there has to make sense okay logical sense rational sense so uh, let's look at that um uh, one the first thing is to interpret the scripture on the basis of the context okay so we look at scripture we look at the context of the verse um the, which means the what is the uh, when we look at the text okay what is the context what is the background and what is the thought behind that passage and then we interpret that okay uh, for example um let me just share this verse i think we many times when we pray we use this verse and uh, and sometimes we you know we we tell you know uh, people also you know god's thoughts are not our thoughts okay so let's look at that verse um you know i'm referring to verse 8 of course uh, in isaiah chapter 55 we say uh, where god says for my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are your ways my ways okay uh, says the lord for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts now when we look at this we know that that's true okay god's thoughts are definitely higher uh, he he has uh, infinite wisdom he knows the end from the beginning and therefore you know he he has that so his thoughts his ways are definitely much higher okay but every time as a child of god as a believer you know sometimes we use that uh, okay uh, we might even cancel out um the leading of the holy spirit or the instruction of the holy spirit um by saying you know my thoughts are not his thoughts you know i have this desire i have this but then my thoughts are not his thoughts that's taking that scripture out of context you know let's look, read from verse 6 uh verse 6 seek the lord while he may be found call upon call upon him while he is near let the wicked forsake his thoughts uh, forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts okay let him return to the lord and he will have mercy on him and to our god for he will abundantly pardon so this um verse is about the wicked forsaking their way the unrighteous forsaking their thoughts because everything is um, you know filled with unrighteousness so the ways the behavior the way life is unrighteous life or wicked life so here's the exhortation you know let there be a forsaking of it let there be a renouncing of it and return to the lord to receive his mercy okay and to our god um, because he will abundantly pardon and then goes on to say no this is what god says my thoughts are not your thoughts so primarily he is actually referring to the wicked and the unrighteousness um, and the on the and the unrighteous uh, person and he's saying you know you you forsake this you leave this out because my thoughts are not your thoughts my ways are not your ways now uh, like i said earlier you know as a believer yes you know uh, we can think carnal thoughts we can uh, walk in carnal ways but if you look at this scripture this is what god is uh referring to when when this verse is there this when, when this declaration about his thoughts and his ways are uh, mentioned this is the background okay. so when we look at the context of scripture then we understand what is the larger context what is the um you know what what is really being being mentioned here what is highlighted here then we when then we understand this um uh another scripture is also paul saying you know i can do all things i think we see that in philippians right uh, i can do all things to christ who strengthens me um and uh, um okay let me just take that verse uh, okay okay so uh, philippians 4 and um, verse 13 i can do all things through christ who strengthens me now um well uh, uh, you know you know as believers as a new creation people we can we can as new creations we can always you know we can always make that bold declaration thank you hope 
um, Philippians 4.13, we can always make that bold, bold declaration that, uh, yeah, I can do all things through Christ. And whatever God has called me to do, he will equip me, he has anointed me, so I can do those things. Right? There's nothing wrong. Okay, uh, But if you look at the context of that verse, we see Paul saying, um, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Verse 12, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Okay. Yes, definitely, you know, uh, in other, we know in other epistles, he talks about how, you know, we, we are called to be led in a triumphant procession in Christ Jesus and there's victory in the blood of Jesus and so on, which is, which is true, right? So, uh, but when we look at the context, we see that Paul is saying, you know, I can live that way also. You know, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound and I can do all these things through Christ. Okay. Uh, well, can we use this verse to encourage another person and uh, you know, encourage ourselves? Say, you know, I can do this. Of course, we can. Right? But when we when we see the context of uh, we we when we see the context in which the scripture is mentioned, then we know that okay, so this is the context. Okay, um, so that's the thing. Right. So uh, interpret it. Look at the context. Um, larger context. Secondly, uh, when, we, when it comes to um, critical um, interpretation, the second thing is to interpret it in the light of progressive revelation. Okay, so what is progressive revelation? We see that scripture, you know, uh, we understand the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. We understand the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we see that certain things uh, do not continue after the cross. Okay. Uh, for example, the the sacrifices which were pointing to the cross. Okay, um, so these were symbolic. These were the shadow of the things, and we have the substance. So beyond, you know, after the cross, these practices were discontinued. So because you know we have the substance now, uh, what whatever they were pointing to had actually happened, had happened, and by one sacrifice he has perfected or he has perfected forever those who are being perfected right um so we we see that and so we need to understand scripture in the light of progressive uh, revelation so that we don't teach something unless we don't teach something which brings people into bondage you now if you look at um, you know galatians the book of galatians that that was what is happening right in the book of Galatians, Paul talks about uh, some Judaizers, or he says false brethren, who came and who were teaching uh, the church that uh, they need to be, yeah, uh, Kennedy, just a minute, I'm just coming to that. So they need to be uh, circumcised, uh, even if they, are, if they put their faith in Jesus, if they are born again, they need to be circumcised, they need to keep the law of Moses uh, in order to be saved. So then the whole book of Galatians, you know, he Paul writes about how how did you receive Christ? How did you receive the Holy Spirit? How did you receive the the the, the, the gifts? So he says, was it not by faith? Right? He goes on to teach that. Okay, yeah, Kennedy, go ahead, please. Uh, you have a question. Um. Um, you might have to mute your mic, unmute your mic, and uh, or you can, whatever question, you can put it in the chat as well. Um, okay, so um, you can do that. So we'll, we'll just keep going uh, till you do that. So uh, look at it in, um, in, in the light of progressive revelation. So that's the, that's the second thing. Third thing is, uh, look at it in harmony with other scripture okay so you look at uh, several other verses in order to see okay is this 
in contradiction with other verses or you know seemingly in contradiction with others what i'm going to teach you know is it is it in harmony with other scripture is it in harmony with the character of god the nature of god is it in uh, harmony is it in line with other uh, scripture okay and and then so that's that's the third way to see that's the third um uh the the, the that the third uh, what do you call um method or third uh, uh rule in uh, in in interpreting scripture you know is it in harmony with other scripture okay so do you have a question or Uh, sorry pastor my keys got pressed yeah <laughs> okay 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 no worries okay let's uh, let's keep going okay then the other thing is um interpret the clear or whatever sorry interpret the unclear you know something that seems to be uh not very clear you know we read it grammatically of course it makes sense uh we look at the uh historical uh information we look at the context uh but it's still a little unclear okay um so don't build a doctrine out of that okay uh, like some passages you know for example um luke chapter 16 and verse 9 if you look at the notes it's in um, it's in uh, the, the the same uh, same section on interpretation luke chapter 16 and verse 9 and the lord says now he's talking about the parable of the uh, the the parable of where he talks about talks about the mammon and he says in verse 9 and i say to you make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon and when you fail they may receive you into an everlasting home now this apparently was used by the the mormon church uh, or uh, sorry this was used by the catholic church uh, talk about or to promote the whole doctrine of indulgences right so um so where you pay a certain amount of money and uh, for obtaining a license to sin okay um so th- this was one of the scriptures that based on which you know the whole thing of indulgences another scripture 1 corinthians 15 and verse 29 okay um where paul uh, uh, makes a very uh, you know categorical statement uh, verse 29 otherwise what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all why then are they baptized for the dead so the corinthian church he's talking about um, some practice is referring to a practice where there was a uh, there seems to have been some form of baptism for the sake of the dead now he doesn't condone it he doesn't teach about it and any of the epistles he doesn't say that you know this is something that needs to be done right for the sake of the dead that you do something right that you get baptized or you know, he doesn't say that so he's referring to something that was happening there probably a pagan pa- practice uh, he's referring to something and he say and the whole passage if you see uh, uh, and the section of that uh, where this verse occurs he's talking about uh, resurrection from the dead and he is refuting people who are saying that uh, you know he is making a case for the resurrection from the dead and uh, and he is refuting people who are saying that uh, you know there is no resurrection uh, so so um so there um, he says uh, yes mangi a question it it can fish at the section side and now i'll ask, I'll, I'll ask the question i'm so sorry I'm so you can finish this point and then I'll ask the question. Yeah, okay. Okay. So 1 yeah. Corinthians 15 and verse 9, you know, see there he talks about uh, how Christ died for uh, for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, he rose again according to the scriptures and then uh, he's you know, he's talking about the burial and the resurrection and uh, how that's a reality and and so on and then he goes on to uh, you know, talk about um, uh, this in verse 29. Right? He says that uh, you know, you know why are you doing this why why is this baptism happening for the dead you know so he's referring to that and he's saying you know you people you know that there is an afterlife you know that there is a resurrection from the dead and and uh, you know with that in mind you are doing this 
right? Uh, for the sake of those who are already dead, you know, you're trying to do something here. So you also know that there is a, uh, yeah, there is an afterlife, that there is a resurrection from the dead. So he's he's referring to this, uh, this practice, uh, and uh, he's you know, talking about this. So you know, if we use this verse in order to do something for the sake of those who are already dead, then we would be in error, right? So uh, it, uh, so, you know, if it is an unclear verse, if it is something that is um, uh, not very clear, not, so we interpret it in the light of other scripture, which, which are very clear, you know, which is very sure, which is established. So we, interpret it in that way okay um yes Maggie. so you can ask your question now thank you sir um my question is our question comes from uh section two on mm. let's find it on um, interpreting the, the the scripture in the light of progressive revelation yep in case of uh polygamy where paul told uh timothy that any overseer or deacon must be above reproaching the man of one wife yeah. concerning polygamy if we in in the church we are presented with someone with before he was a believer he had two wives or three wives and then it comes to Christ. Mm. how can we handle that mm. So, okay, so you're talking about a culture where there is polygamy and uh, this person, uh, so person's currently having, you know, two wives or three wives, is that the scenario? Yes, sir. Okay. So now that's a difficult, um, you know, uh, that's a difficult uh, thing to do. Um, so how would we do that? Okay, so um, so currently, is he, uh, you know, so that's that's the thing, you know. Currently, is he is he living with all three, uh, or is he separate? Right. So uh, these living, are living with, living all, with three. all three. Yeah. So, uh, but he's a he's a good believer, and uh, he's faithful, and he's you know. Uh, so maybe you know, uh, this is what I would do. Uh, you know, I would probably not make him a deacon or, uh, you know, a, a visible kind of a thing, ministry or not, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, spiritual ministry, uh, if he's continuing to live that way. Okay, now, of course, uh, he didn't know it was done in ignorance or maybe that was the tradition that was a culture and he has, you know, uh, done that. Um, so... In my, this is just my opinion. Probably we can think about it and see how we can handle it. Uh, of course, we. Uh, uh, I'm just saying this because uh, I've not faced that situation. Um, so, okay, let's let's think about it. Let's um, thank you for that question. Uh, let's think about it and see how we can handle it. Um, if we have, you know, such uh, situation in our church. Okay, uh, Sam. I think we'll, yeah, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, just a, a suggestion. Um, I loved what you did uh, last semester with our financial steward, where we had a document where we put all the questions and we would refer that oh, every okay. now and then see. So I'm just suggesting if we could do something like this. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Yeah, so these are some great questions, which we normally, um, which, which may not be, you know, uh, uh, part of your culture, but then in, in another, another culture, yes. it happens. So it's great. Thanks, Sam. So we'll do Hello. that. <laughs> Hi. OK, so we'll, we'll do that. I'll uh, I'll just put a, you know, I'll give you guys a link, and then you can enter the questions, uh, whatever questions you might have. And we'll try to answer that uh, during the course of uh, the class. OK, but this is one section, you know, this interpretation of scripture. This is one section. And then we will on to the actual, um, you know, um, the 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 specifics of uh, biblical preaching okay uh, just two other things is interpreting the spirit of the passage okay and not necessarily the letter uh, where matthew 7 and verse 5 where jesus says the lord jesus says remove the plank from your own eye and then you will be 
you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So, so what is he saying? He's saying uh, it is, of course, again a figure of speech there. But he's saying, you know, you have something in you. You you have actually you yourself are doing something that is wrong, or you you yourself are living a sin, or maybe you are living in unforgiveness, whatever it is, and you are trying to help another person who is having a similar situation so he's saying you know first you remove that you know remove the plank so it does not mean that there is a you know it's a hyperbole which means it's an exaggerated figure of speech remove the plank which is in your eye in order to clear the speck in uh, the other person's eye okay and lastly of course interpret with dependence upon the holy spirit you know very very important he's the author of scripture the entire scripture inspired by the holy spirit and therefore we interpret uh, depending uh, with our full dependence on the holy spirit right so uh, with that we come to the end of this section uh, sam thanks for the suggestion i'll i'll put up a link where you can you know enter those questions and um, thank you for all the questions um, uh, we'll we'll try to answer the rest in the next class. Okay, um, so God bless. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording here. Um, we'll meet in the next session. Thank you so much, sir, for beautiful class.